All right, guys, we've got a early 60s D28 here. Um, I thought I'd show you an evaluation on a non 70s. You know, I work on so many 70s, done lots of evaluations on those. Um, this is a 60s, and I can't remember if 62, 63, whatever it is. Yeah, it's Brazilian rosewood, obviously. And you can tell, you know, these dark stripes right here. Um, you can just tell it's Brazilian rosewood, plus it's the right edge. So, main thing the owner needs is a neck reset. Uh, so I thought I would look at it, see what else it might need. And obviously it needs a neck reset. It's got a very high action here. Which is so high I couldn't even measure it with my feeler gauges. So I use the other way technique of using the calipers right here and just put it in there. Get it up around there. Uh, the action is 135. It ought to be like 93. So 135 thousandths, 93. Saddle, it's got some saddle here. So let's look at the saddle. The saddle, first of all, is wrong for this guitar. It's a short saddle, but it's leaning forward like crazy right here. And that's because it doesn't fit in the slot. So that's bad because that's going to crack the front of the bridge, cause all kinds of problems. So that's a problem, but that's all right because I'm going to do neck reset on it so I'm going to get a new saddle anyways. Oh, uh, what else now at the bridge? This might not be the original bridge. Um, he thought it might not be. Or he said, yeah, I look at the bridge. It needs to be replaced. I look at the bridge and it, it looks pretty good. If it's a replacement, uh, it's a decent replacement, except for the fact that it's got a short saddle in it. But the curves look really good. The width is about right. So I'm not in any hurry to replace that bridge. But I am going to cut a long saddle slot in here. Before I cut the long saddle slot, I want to know what the intonation is like. What's the saddle location look like? So, get my little magic ruler out again, lay it on the middle of the 12th fret. And the saddle is in a pretty good location. It needs to be back in its original location for me to cut through. Um, and that'll be fine. It'll still be good there. So, I want to. I want to restore that to a long vintage saddle. Um, it's, it's leaning forward because of this extremely sharp brake angle right here, which I, I don't want to flip the guitar around and bang it into the wall. So, But that low E string is coming almost straight up and forward, so that's causing a tremendous forward force on that saddle, which is why it's leaning. The bridge is overslotted. The slot comes all the way up to the saddle. So I will probably fill in that slot, move this up, take care of that brake angle, um, and stop that leaning, because there's no way a saddle would not lean with that low E coming straight up the edge like that and across the top. So bridge needs some work. What else do I notice about it? The pick guard is coming up, and if I look at it real closely right here, I can see that the rosette has come up. It's down over here, it comes up over here, and it's not wanting to push down. So it looks to me like maybe that rosette popped up. The pick guard shrunk, brought the rosette up with it, and somebody just shoved glue down there and getting to get this pushed down. I think that's the original pick guard. I think I'm probably gonna want to yeah, it's loose over here a little bit. I'm probably going to want to remove the pick guard, fix this up, um, and then stick it back down with sticky tape rather than gluing it. And it's shrunken in here, or it's caved in, because the pick guard shrunk and it's caused the top to cave in right there. It's got a definite potato chip going on right here. I think I would like to fix that. Got to clear all that with the owner, of course. Oh, what else do I see? Let's look inside. Let's see what the bridge plate's doing. I don't think I've looked inside of it yet. Bridge plate looks real good. 
Looks original. It's thin. Braces are non scalloped. Looks like it's had a repaired loose brace. I can see a little bit of glue smear. And that's not uncommon. It's had a pickup attachment right here at one time. Popsicle brace is intact. There's cracks. Got cracks alongside the fingerboard right here. Um, which the popsicle brace is supposed to prevent and doesn't. So I'm going to take some um, naphtha. Squeeze along there. Let's do it on this side too. Let's see if it runs through. That'll tell me if there's cracks go through or if they're repaired or what's going on over there. Go ahead and wipe this off now. It'll heat the finish up if you leave it on for an hour or two, you know. So you just need a little bit. And side looks good. Nothing coming through there. It's just coming through on the base side. Yeah, I can see where it's shifted. Okay. The, ros uh, the rosette is shifted right there. So we got a crack one in here. Which I would normally, at this point, remove the popsicle brace and put my brace in right here, which is which fixes these crack. But we'll see how bad it is once I get the neck off of it. So it definitely needs a neck reset. That's coming off. But the good news is the trouble side looks pretty good. The sound hole is all chewed up, as you can see. I'm not worried about that. That just, you know, that happens. The only thing you can do there is enlarge the sound hole, which I'm not sure I would do. It's already enlarged without the chips on it. Uh, the nut is plastic. I can tell it's plastic because there's no striations in there. It might be ivory. But it looks plastic to me. And it's also shifted. See, he's uh, shifted it off to the side here because the spacing is not right. So it's going to get a new nut because it's going to get new frets. <clears throat> and he can, can keep the original nut and put it in the case or whatever, but it's... it's not a good nut. So, I'm not in favor of keeping things original that aren't good. You can live in the case. I'm going to set my calipers here to fit between the E and the A. And then they don't fit between the A and the D. And there's a huge gap <laughs> between the D and the G. They fit between G and B. And another big gap. So, the nuts all wonky so just to give you an example of how big of a gap that is between the e and the a we've got 240 and between the d and the g we've got 275 so you got a 35 thousandths of an inch difference in spacing that much in other words that's a whole uh, d string d string is 35 yeah so your D-string is one complete width off. So, seeing as the nuts shifted over anyways to get the ease balanced out, a little too far really, a lot more space over here. Um, you know, I don't have any issue at all with replacing that nut. Good bone nut. And like I said, this one can live in the case because it's not a good nut. Okay, now on the frets, this was um, another complaint. I'm seeing a lot of divots here. The B string right there has got a, a very, very deep divot. It goes almost down to the wood. So we've got to definitely do frets. Um, how far up? How many frets? Well, when I look over here at these frets, for instance, and hopefully the GoPro will pick this up. But right here, these are very flat topped. And it's, you know, especially up in here. So what's going to happen now is when you try to fret, that string doesn't fit on the crown of the fret. It fits on this flat surface like this. And so it's going to slop around on that flat surface. It's hard, hard to get any bite on it. And it'll also throw the intonation off because it's going to put 
the string is going to lead leave that edge of the fret instead of the middle of the fret so it's going to be slightly sharp all the way up the neck and especially up here i can see that these frets are really low um, they've been sanded down filed down flat so that's usually an indication that the neck has too much relief and it's causing a dip to happen right here and they're buzzing up here and somebody comes in there and they, they oh it's high up here it's got the 14th fret hump which is not even a hump it's a dip in the neck due to too much relief so what they do is they come in here and they file this down and they file the fresh down in order to make the string clear and that's completely the wrong approach uh, in my humble opinion what you need to do is take the relief out of the neck so that it's flat so the strings come up that and there's no dip like this see this is what's happening it's not like there's a hump right here at the 14th fret it's more like it comes up to here and then there's a dip and that creates the illusion of a hump but it's not a hump it's a dip in the neck so you take this and you straighten it up and all of a sudden the strings start clearing it so that's our problem here and i can double check that by getting the notch straight edge out take a look at the fingerboard itself and I find yeah it's got a lot of relief and right up in here as is typical is where it's touching so I can reduce the relief a couple of ways uh, the way I'm probably going to do it is to just sand down a little bit right in here using a radius block sand down between the first and the third fret the, the nut and the third fret and I will bring that neck back. Right now it's like this. I'll bring that neck back like this. That will create, that will reduce the relief by dropping it down off of this end. Uh, when I do the frets, I will also use possibly compression frets, but more likely just make sure they're seated in there tight and keep that neck from uh, bending up much. I'll see what it looks like when I get the strings off, you know, how much does that neck come back or whatever. But we have a problem here. We have too much relief. It's causing a, um, the illusion of a hump up here. Uh, part of that's going to be alleviated when I do the neck crochet and I bring it down a little bit, but not all of it. Cause what that, what it does when you, when you bring the neck down, it changes the tension on it. So right now the neck is too high. So now it will bend upwards. I can't make my arm bend in the middle. But it will cause it to bend up like this. And then when you bring it down, the force of the strings comes in more of a straight line. And it won't bend as much. So it alleviates it a little bit by bringing the neck back down. Also, when you got a guitar that needs a neck reset like this, normally the neck should be sitting on the body at about a two degree angle. So again, you have your straight edge here. And straight edge across the top. The neck drops, so the neck is like this, to exaggerate. Um, so what happens here is the extension is up above the guitar. But as the neck angle gets worse and worse and worse, you can see it happening right here. As the neck angle gets worse, this gap closes down, and that starts putting pressure on the top right here. And that's possibly why you get those fingerboard cracks. That's one reason. So when you do the neck reset, you can pull this neck back like this, and then you're going to have an angle, and then you're going to push this down to the fingerboard rather than it doing this number, you see. That's putting a lot of pressure right there. Might be one reason why you get that. So we've got a couple of issues going on here. We've got too much relief here. It's causing a bump up here. It needs a neck reset. It needs a new nut. Uh, the pick guard. The bridge needs to be reworked a little bit, but it's a good looking bridge other than that. So as far as the neck reset goes, I said that's 135 thousandths. And we have a saddle height over here of about 110. So I would like the saddle height to be about more like 130. I don't want to go too high on a vintage. I want this, it's 110 right now. I want it to be 130, 20 thousandths of an inch difference. That means the action will change by another 10 thousandths of an inch. 
So the action is 135 right now. So with the correct saddle, the action would be 145, roughly. Well, that's what I run with. So the action would be 145. I want it to be 93, so 145 minus 93, 52 thousandths. I want the action to change 52 thousandths of an inch. It takes twice that distance from here, so the saddle has got to change by twice that, so 52 times 2 is 104. Saddle's got to change by 104, which means I pretty much would have to take the entire saddle off of here to get the action I want. So 104, it's a 3 to 1 ratio again, so 3 down to 1, 104 divided by 3, 35 thousandths of an inch. That's a very typical neck we set. 35 thousandths of an inch off of the heel right here. And I will mark that and see. And the heel looks like it's on there pretty tight, so nothing funny going on there. It's had a previous neck we set because I can see the two holes right there and that's you know if you can see that a lot of guys i mean i have hidden them really well before like on roy's d28 uh d18 what is it whatever it is the other 70s we've been looking at and i said man i don't think it's had an equity yet i can't see the dots and when i took it apart i found out i had filled it with a toothpick did a terrific job of hiding that hole but i don't mind seeing the holes too much they're hard to see you got to look at them and then when I see it, I know this guitar has had a previous neck reset. Not that it really does me any good, but I might be aware for epoxy. You know, maybe the previous guy epoxied the neck on, something like that. All I know is that if I have any trouble getting that neck off, I go, okay, it's had a previous neck reset. Uh, who knows what the other guy did. <laughs> but I don't think I'm going to have a problem with that. Two holes, so I doubt he used epoxy. Probably somebody pretty good did this. Now, over on the top, I notice a little bit of a bump right here, but it doesn't look bad. I don't think we've got a loose brace. Remember I said I think there's been a loose brace that's fixed in here. And so that might just be an indication of that. It doesn't look bad at all. I don't think there's any issues going on there. Uh, where's my little feeler gauge? Here it is. And the bridge is on tight. I'm probing around it. So the bridge looks good. I don't see any reason to replace the bridge or mess with it other than filling or recutting that saddle slot filling in the uh, over zealous um, string slots so my first course of action i'm probably going to do the bridge first because i want to get the correct saddle in there um so yeah i'm probably going to do that i'm going to fill the bridge and recut it and then get the correct height saddle so that I'll have it for reference when I'm doing the neck reset. Probably do that like right now. And once I've got that taken care of, then I will I'll probably do the frets first after that. I'll do that and the frets at the same time because I want to see how much this is going to change when I take care of that relief. Um, it will drop it. It will drop the action a little bit. So after I get the correct saddle, get the relief taken care of, um, get some of these frets taken care of, then I will do the neck reset. Probably also do the nut at that time because I'm going to have some new frets in there. So I'll do the bridge, the frets, the nut. I'll get all that good and running condition, and then I will do the neck reset. Okay, so I'm not sure how many frets I'm going to do here. My inclination... If money was not an issue, 35,000, uh, I mean, it's a little low. It's not terrible. The main thing is that flat top right there, and I'm not sure I can recrown those because they've been flattened so much. My inclination would be to just do 15 new frets uh, and be done with it. You know, then I know they're all good. And they're all glued in there. And they've got too much bevel on the edges. And again, being planted flat down here on this edge. I would spend so much time recrowning and polishing and all that that it would be easier for me to just put 15 new frets in. So that's probably what I'm going to do. Bridge. Frets. Relief. Nut. And then do the neck shot. So that's the 60s.
He's 28. All people ask all the time, well, how come you don't do ABs on these things? Well, this action's 135. I mean, shoot, I can't even play it. Um, so, I know it's not going to sound as good as it can because it's just so hard to play. And to me, the playing is a lot of the sound of the guitar. So, in other words, I learned this from Stuart Duncan, Nashville fiddle player, you know. I went to school with him at South Plains College. And years later, I interviewed him and I asked him about uh, what kind of action he had on his mandolin. And he said, it depends on what kind of sound I want. And I said, well, what do you mean? What kind of sound do you want? And he said, on a mandolin and guitar and everything, if you want a high action, there's a slight delay between the time you let go of this note and move to this note. And that slight delay in sound helps result in a staccato sound. So if you want like a Bill Monroe sound, raise your action up and you fight with it a little bit, but you get that staccato choppy sound. If you want a slinkier sound like Tony Rice, uh, any of the modern mandolin players, uh, Chris Steely is a terrific example of the slinky, silky um, lead sound, drop your action. And it makes that delay just ever so more perceptible. And it's easier to move from the next note to the one note to the next note. So the same thing holds on a guitar. When you got this high action like here, there's just this little choppy delay. And that affects my hearing of the guitar. Because it doesn't sound the way I want it to sound. Or I'm used to hearing it. It sounds choppy. And so I'm going to tell you that it doesn't sound very good because I can't play it. Um, therefore, I'm not gelling with the guitar. And when the guitar plays good, I am going to sound better on it because I like the way it sounds and I'm enjoying playing it and it's reacting to me. Um, and so I'm just going to play better. Just like having your motorcycle, you know, I race dirt bikes. You guys know I have another channel. If your suspension isn't right, it, you're not going to get comfortable. You're going to, oh, God, that's rough. Or your bike won't turn because the forks aren't sticking on the ground or the forks are diving too much or they're not diving enough. And all of these things, and if your suspension isn't right, you will never get comfortable with that bike and you will never ride it as good as you could ride it if it were better. Yes, if you're a good rider, you can make up to a point for the bad setup. So, yeah, I can play this guitar and I can make it sound pretty good and I can play it fairly well to a point. But I would never walk on stage at the Winfield Flat Picking Contest with this guitar right now as is because it's unforgiving, it's non-reactive, it's got a choppy sound to it, and that sort of thing. So, I, I could never play my best on this guitar the way it is. It's got nothing to do with the guitar. You know, it's probably a great guitar when we get it done. I mean, it's an early 60s D20. It was Brazilian Rosewood. So how can you go wrong? But that's why I don't do very many pre-ABs. It's because the guitar just doesn't play good, doesn't sound good. Um, and so it's going to sound bad because I don't like it. When I get done and I like it, it's going to sound good. So. There's more to your guitar than just the sound. It's so much more about how you how you feel with it. Because I guarantee you that if you like the way it feels, you will play better. So, this is a nice 60s D28. Cool. I mean, it's got lots of bangs and nicks. And, you know, this is what an old D28 would look like. The top is kind of yellow. Um, the owner asked about that. So, let's make a quick comment. It's a little bit yellow. Uh, compared to a, what I would think of as a Sitka top. Sitka top is brown. And this one's definitely got a yellow sheen to it. There's a possibility it could be German, uh, Engelmann. You know, I can't tell. Nobody can really tell just by looking at it. But it does look like it's a non-Sitka top. And after I get it strung up and played it, I could give you the indication of whether it might be Engelman or German or whatever, because each of those have sort of a characteristic sound. And again, it's not a 
it's, I would never bet a dime on my diagnosis, but it does not look quite like a sick guitar. It does look a little bit like a German. It could also be Engelmann. So we'll see if we string it up. To me, German tops have a little bit of a honky sound to them. A little bit of a... Oh, I don't know. It's not bad. I just describe it as a honk. Uh, Engelmann has a really super sweet trebles. Just round trebles. And I can nearly always tell an Engelmann top guitar uh, from a known guitar. You know, where the builder says, yeah, that's an Engelmann top. So, for instance, one of my mandolins, I had no idea what the words were. And I got it and I played it and I thought, man, this is, sounds like an Engelman top. So I emailed the builder and I asked him and he said, yeah, it's Engelman. <laughs> so I feel good about that. So anyway, D28, I'm going to get working on the bridge and um, the frets right now. See you later.